I wanted to show you just one more example of a multi-stage pump. Look at that beast. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven bulls. Eleven bulls on that multi-stage pump. That pump there is designed to pull water from a very deep, a, a deep depth and to push that water a long distance. It's a very expensive pump. We've already, one done, we've already completed one video on certification, or <laughs> certification, centrifugal pumps. Uh, stuff happens. I'm gonna tumble over my words once in a while and I'm not gonna edit that out of the video. So. We've already completed one video on centrifugal pumps. General information, just to get us started thinking about certain centrifugal pumps. This next, vi this next video and lecture is hands-on centrifugal pumps. So what you're not gonna see to my students here is the video that we've shot out in the field with centrifugal pumps. But you'll see it in the video when it hits YouTube next week, the next week or two. Okay, let's start with the well site. <clears throat> a utility, when a new water source, a new source <coughs> water is required, a utility is going to hire engineers to go out and look for nearby sources of water that we can treat and provide to our customers, meaning the potable water standards by the Safe Drinking Water Act. Um, with a minimal treatment. One of our jobs as an operator is to be efficient. And part of being efficient means doing things at the right cost. We don't want to spend too much money. We don't want to spend too little money and not do the job right. So developing well, will, uh, a well site will include potential so identifying potential sources of pollution. <clears throat> a well cannot be built within 200 feet of a known source of pollution. So some of these things can be like um, dairies. Dairies that are either active or have closed and been, you know, closed out, decommissioned. Uh, it might be a landfill. It might be an industrial waste facility, a waste treatment facility where they take chemicals, even radioactive chemicals, and treat them. And so we don't want our wells to be within 200 feet of sites like that. In fact, in some cases, we want them to be much more remote or away from those potential sources of pollution. Um, <clears throat> we're gonna talk about grout and concrete. So when a well is being developed, first, once we've identified that, hey, we're gonna, use, we're gonna dig a well, we're gonna do it right here, they've already done all the geological uh, research, they've already done test wells, they have already have an idea of how much water is available in that well site, in that aquifer, how much water can be pumped out, and that could be in GPMs, it could also be in gallons over a period of time. Um, so a lot of things are done before this, but the basic components of a well site include once the uh, casing has been set in the drill hole, in the well. Once you set the casing, we are going to grout and concrete around the casing down to pretty much a minimum of 50 feet or until you reach some impermeable material. That's, that's some layer of sediment that will not allow water to filter through it or pass through it. So we're going to secure that casing with grout and concrete, and this is a case-by-case -case basis. It just depends on the geological structures beneath the ground where the well is dug. <clears throat> we will set a wellhead on top of the casing. The wellhead is a structure, and it depends on the type of pump that you're using as well, but it's a structure that will fit on the wellhead to take uh, the components, whether it's a, a, a pump that where the motor is sitting on the at that level or at that grade. Um, 
there's a couple of different motors and pumps that we use in this industry for well sites, and we're gonna go over that here in a few minutes. The sanitary seal is a rubber or neoprene material that sits between the well head and the casing. It keeps that groundwater, um, it prevents pollution. It prevents uh, contamination by pollution. So, and then we have the gravel pack. The gravel pack is something that at the lower or deepest regions of the well casing will pack gravel around the, pel the, the pump casing to keep sand from entering the well, to getting pumped uh, into the well, past the screen, and up into the water supply. It prolongs the life, the service life of our pumps and motors and allows us to maintain the yield that we're looking for. That's the amount of water that we desire to pump. Okay, so here's just a representation, a cutaway or a profile view of a well. And it's very, very simple. And I included this because I want you to see that at ground level, you have a wellhead. And at this point you have a, where the water comes out, it discharges at a 90 degree angle. And up here we have a motor. So we have a, a pump that pulls water from this well, discharges at a 90 degree angle, and the motor is up here. We're gonna go into certain details about that type of pump and motor here in a moment. But I wanted you to also see that <clears throat> the casing, the outer casing extends far down. In this representation, it goes all the way down to bedrock. And here, so it looks just below grade or ground level, you have the static water level of the aquifer. So I want to explain that. <clears throat> the aquifer is not caves and caverns full of water. It's mostly sand, gravel, stone, that type of material that's permeable. It allows water to flow through it. Now it flows very, very slowly, but the water flows through it and it's a natural filter action. So what we do is we plant this, we build or develop this well, we dig down deep, well below the static water level. That's the level of the aquifer when there's no pumps running. What happens is when we start up the pump, it creates a vortex, just like you would see in your bathroom sink when you fill the sink up with water and you pull the plug, you'll see a vortex of water, a vortex build up. And what that vortex is doing is it's allowing air into the drain. <clears throat> so we never want this vortex to develop in such a way where it reaches the pump because it can actually damage the pump. We don't, we don't want to pump air. Such people pumps do not like to pump air. So I'm explaining some of this to you and you're gonna see it in your study material because even though this is geared towards more of a water treatment plant operator, it's important for the distribution operator to understand source water, well sites, the basic functions of them, what types of pumps they use and how that water gets delivered into the distribution system. So question one, wells are highly susceptible to pollution. Several measures are employed to protect the groundwater. This is used to prevent the well from caving in. What do you think the answer is? Well, it'd be consider your sanitary seal at that point, or either that or your gravel pack. This is used to prevent the well, the well from caving oh. in. No, your, your cement grout, sorry. Yeah, it's your cement and your yeah. grout, right? I'm reading that one wrong. Yeah, it's okay, that's all right. This is, uh, this is new information for my crew. We've been developing this information pretty quickly and I don't always get the study guides out to them with enough time for them to read through them and study them first, so I'm hitting them. I'm testing them today. Number two, welding the wellhead to the casing may be an option. Otherwise, name the component used when connecting the wellhead to the pump casing. That would be your sanitary. Sanitary seal. Yeah. Very good. Very good. Number three, sand may build up and block well screens, reducing the yield. Gravel pack. 
What is used to reduce the amount of sand pumped from a well? Jedediah. Um, cement and grout. This this is going to be the gravel pack. Wow. That's yeah, he pack. had it right. Okay. I'm just tired of him. Actually, <laughs> I was <laughs> trying not to listen to him. <laughs> yeah. You did a very good job. Yeah, it's the gravel pack. The gravel pack is going to set up around the well screens and keep the sand or reduce the amount of sand that makes it past the screen. Here we have a wellhead. This, this well site was developed a couple years ago. It's fairly new. That drum you see on the stand is an oil warmer. So in the winter time when the temperatures are cooler, it keeps the mineral oil warm. It warms it up before it feeds uh, into the bearings on the, uh, on the pump. So you see that large motor up there with the green hat. That's the motor. The blue part is the pump or the 90 degree uh, discharge. And below that, below the wellhead, the sanitary seal, and you see that it's elevated and sloped away so it keeps the water draining away That if it rains. Um, below that, what you, what's below that is a vertical turbine centrifugal pump that extends down uh, quite deep at this point um, in this well site to uh, a multi-stage pump. So you see that discharge line, there's a control valve. It comes out this way. Again, all the water's metered through a mag meter. You see gate valves, a clay valve. So that's a control valve. The water. So here at this site, we're pulling water from probably 600 feet or so. So the pumps have to be rated to pull the water up to grade, come through this system, and then 90 down into the ground, the pipe runs below grade to a transmission line or a transmission main. And this one's, what, that looks like 12 inch? Yeah, that's 12 inch. And it runs to a tank farm where we have several ground storage tanks a couple miles away from this point. And it's those, it's that well motor or that well pump that's rated to push water all the, you know, from some 600 feet down all the way up to ground level and then away a couple miles. This is a wellhead for a submersible vertical oh, turbine okay, centrifugal okay. pump. And I know there's a vertical turbine, a submersible pump in there because you see at the top of the wellhead it 90s out and then down into the discharge line or the, in this case, the well fill line or the um, ground, the fill line for the ground storage tank. So if that was a, if that was not a submersible pump, you would see a motor coming out of the top. You would see the 90 and above the 90, you would see the motor. <clears throat> so this is a submersible vertical turbine pump in operation at this well site the water comes up so you see the discharge line that comes uh, that's housed within the casing the pump casing the outside the larger diameter pipe at the bottom there you see is the pump casing I have a reducer that comes up that's the wellhead between the reducer and the wellhead is a sanitary seal see the vent pipe on the far side that comes out like a candy cane it's screened with a fine mesh so insects can't get in there it keeps the insects from getting in but you have the 90 you have a sample port an ARV 
at the top and you see that where it's vented it has a screen also it flows out to a magnetic flow meter and a gate valve real quick lesson on this gate valve you see at the very top you see the two bolts here so this device here this is called a packing gland so below this there's a there's a um, packing it's square braided stock it's kind of like a shoelace but it's square braided it's very thick it's infused with Teflon and what that does is it keeps the water from leaking out if there if it does start to leak and of course this is covered in tenemic we would have to break through the coating the tenemic protects everything from the sun and weather and things like that but we would have to break through the coating and adjust these two nuts a quarter turn at a time to press that packing gland down on the packing to uh, stop the leaking uh, this one looks like it's pretty close. The tolerances are very, very close. So most likely if this begins to leak, instead of tightening it, we would have to take this out of service, isolate it off, remove the packing and replace the packing. I wanna show you the fine mesh screen that you see on the discharge port there. And you'll see the same thing on that candy cane there. And you see the well head is protected from, you know, localized flooding in the area. Um, that's why it's elevated above ground. It's Question four, what is the minimum distance a well may be located from a potential source of pollution? That's gonna be C, 200 feet. 200 feet, very good. And that really is a minimum of 200 feet. Is that like the actual footage on there and that's the requirement? That's the requirement, 200 okay. feet. That's the real answer. Okay. And I'm telling you as an operator with some experience, it's a minimum 200 feet. All right, submersible vertical turbine centrifugal pumps. Um, so these submersible pumps, and here's an example of one right here. You have a motor. This is the motor, and that's the first thing to go into a well that's using a submersible vertical turbine centrifugal pump. Bolted to it is the pump assembly. Now, this motor has a shaft. A rotating shaft right because it's a motor it's an electric motor it's got a spin it's bolted to the pump shaft by a coupling and this is not the first time or the last time you're gonna hear me talk about this and that's talking to my crew that coupling is designed to fail before the shafts get damaged or overly worn um, that coupling will fail first because it's a cheap you know it costs a nickel well, that was pre-COVID, it probably cost, you know, 90 bucks now. Yeah. So, but the motor goes in first. Then we have the pump assembly, which is bolted to the motor. Now you see on this pump assembly, we have one, two, three, four bowls. That's what we call them. We call these bowls. This is a multi-stage pump, vertical turbine, centrifugal pump. It has multiple impellers. So you can think of each bowl as you would think of a volute. Four bowls or four volutes. Each one houses an impeller. Each one has the same specifications as the others. So water that gets, once this gets set in the well, the motor is activated, the impellers start to spin, it pulls water through this screen. This here is the screen pulls water in, it goes through the first pump or the first impeller and bowl to the next one, then the third one, then the fourth one. And then above this pump assembly, 
is the discharge piping. All of this is contained within the casing of the well. So the casing of the well outside of this assembly, the pump assembly and the motor, is full of water. When the, mo when the motor kicks on and the, the pump starts pulling water, it's going to suck water from out of the casing and up the pipe, the discharge pipe, all the way to the surface. Once it gets to the surface, it has a 90 degree discharge and it takes the water away to our ground storage tank. This is a second type of pump. It's a vertical turbine centrifugal pump. Same thing. This one's submersible, but this one, this is what you see at ground level. You see the part of the pump casing that discharges the water away at a 90 degree angle. But the, one of the advantages to this type of pump, and it's called a line shaft pump, is that the motor is right there. You can work on it right there at grade, right there at ground level. With this motor, this vertical turbine, if this goes down and you have to pull it, if you have to pull it to do some type of preventive maintenance, mm -hmm. that, mean a crew, that means a crew has to come in and they have a structure, a big A-frame that they have to send up, set up and they pull the pipe, the discharge piping out, and it's in 20 foot sticks, 20 foot sections, just like we have with our C900 and our ductile pipe that's out here in the system, we get it in 20 foot sticks. So they have to pull this discharge line up 20 feet at a time. They pull it up, they remove a stick, lay it in a rack, pull it up, remove the next stick. So if this thing is 600 feet deep, 800 feet deep, and this is Arizona, so we have that then it takes hours, maybe even days, just to pull the pump to the surface. That means that's a lot of downtime. The pump is, or the well site is shut down, isolated, while this work is going on. And so imagine, what if the only problem was is that coupling failed? You still have to remove everything, huh? You have to spend thousands and thousands of dollars, Ugh. a day or more, to pull the pump to the surface, figure out that it was the coupling that failed, yeah. install a new coupling, and then reset the pump, and then test it to make sure everything works. Would that still be in your, I guess your budget, you would say, versus buying a whole brand new pump assembly? Oh yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah, you, in our utility, we're very careful about that. We have um, line items in our budget to account for that kind of work that needs to be done but we also have critical spares on hand. True. And when you watch the video, you're gonna see some of those critical spares. Yeah. Um, so there's positive and negatives for both of these pumps. Number one, the submersible is less efficient than a line shaft pump. When I say less efficient, is there's, it uses more electricity. Um, it's best for, a positive is it's best for misaligned casings. So if the well casing is misaligned, it's not, it, it's not such a problem for a submersible vertical turbine centrifugal pump. However, the expense, the maintenance expense is pretty high. Uh, the line shaft pump, it's more expensive. That's a drawback. So the upfront cost is more expensive. Um, but it is more efficient, uses less electricity. And like I was saying before, all the stuff you got to work on most of the time is above grade. Mm -hmm. So the motor, it's right there. And you see here, you have the motor, but right inside that housing, there is a motor shaft, a coupling attached to a pump shaft. Okay, so number five. This type of pump is used to pull water from a well or send reclaimed water long distances. It's gonna be your multi-stage pump, multi-stage pump. Number six, the submersible vertical turbine pump and the vertical turbine pump are examples of multi-staged centrifugal pumps. Multi-stage centrifugal pumps, very good. Number seven, anytime pumps are operated in a series where one pump or impeller discharges to the suction side of another pump. 
the blank will increase while the blank remains the same. Yeah, pressure to flow, B. So the pressure will increase while the flow remains the same? Yes. Very good. So, and I'm gonna go ahead and skip back because I wanna use this as an example. So what we're saying here is that, whoops, stuff happens, put that right there. So what we're saying here is that I've got basically four pumps here. I have four impellers and bowls. We can describe it in a few different ways. And let's say that each one of these is rated to move a thousand gallons a minute at a hundred feet of head. And we can translate head to pressure. It just takes a little bit of math. We're gonna go into that in a different video. So thousand gallons a minute, hundred feet of head. So every pump has a suction side and a discharge side. That's, the, that's true for these bulls. If we're looking at them as an individual pump. So it's pulling water in a thousand gallons a minute at a hundred feet of head. And it's discharging it to the suction side of the next pump, the one that's stacked right above it. This pump can only pull a thousand gallons a minute at a hundred feet ahead. So a thousand gallons a minute, even though there's four pumps or four bowls on this multi-stage pump, it's only ever going to pull a thousand gallons a minute. However, the head increases. So this is at 100 feet ahead. The second one, that would be 200 feet ahead. Then we get to 300 feet ahead and 400 feet ahead, which means we can send the water up that column a greater height. And once it 90 degrees over to go to a ground storage tank, depending on the pump, we can size it to deliver water to the ground storage tank that's on the site or several miles away. It just depends on what we're trying to accomplish. I wanted to show you a well head. Now, this is a small well head, but the technology is the same. You see up here is where the 90 would be attached, the discharge 90. So that's the top of the well head. And this is a well head that would be used for a submersible vertical turbine pump. This is the vent pipe, and on top of that would be the candy cane, or a 290s, so it turns and faces down. The opening would be screened. What you see here is <clears throat> the neoprene or rubber sanitary seal, and this is where we would bolt <clears throat> the well head to the pump casing and this here is the discharge line where the water flows up in, into the, uh, the discharge side of the wellhead. This one's older, it's been taken out of service, but you see that seal is held up pretty, pretty tight. It's gotten old and worn on the side, but it was still a good seal. Number eight, what term describes the condition that exists when the source of the water supply is below the center line of the pump? Below is suction lift. Suction C. lift. We also call that negative suction head. Suction lift C is the correct answer. Now we're going to get into the booster pump station. Most of the pumps that we use in the water wastewater industry are centrifugal pumps. We're going to the booster pump station is used to pull the water from the ground storage tank, put it in the distribution system, and send it to the customer. Now the ground storage tank, and again, one of our jobs is to be efficient, right? So if we don't need to build a pump to move water, we don't. We have a pump that takes the water out of the well and dumps it into a ground storage tank. We can design a pump facility with positive suction ahead, right? That's ideal because if we can use gravity as our source of energy to move water from one place to another, we should do it. 
right? We do that in the collection system by building gravity sewers that are at a very slight slope and gravity takes the water at a calculated flow velocity and takes it to where we want it to go. So when we build a booster pump station, typically there's gonna be a ground storage tank right next to it. And that ground storage tank is gonna be, and they're in, they can be built in just about any dimension, but they're typically cylinders, they're round. We have ground storage tanks in our system that are 30 feet in diameter, and we have some that are, I think the largest one is 85 feet in diameter. We have ground storage tanks that are 22 feet in height, we have ground storage tanks that are over 30 feet in height. So, but the thing is, is the well pump fills up that ground storage tank. All we got to do at the bottom is install a valve and a 90. It's a drain. So when we, when our booster pump station is ready to go, the volutes are open, the pumps are ready to go, but not running, all we need to do is open up that valve at the bottom of the ground storage tank, the water will flow out, get to the booster pump station, it'll prime all the volutes because there's positive suction head, it'll maintain prime in all the volutes, we'll bleed out the air, then we'll kick on the pump, the first pump. Now each pump should be sized, oh and one more note, so if as long as we keep those volutes prime, they won't cavitate, they're less likely to cavitate. We want to make sure that they don't cavitate. Once they start to cavitate, it destroys the impeller, then the volute, and then the whole pump. So, um, I was going to say, I was going into something else. I lost my train of thought because I saw that I hadn't talked about cavitation, but that's okay. We were talking about the, uh, the size of the pumps, how they should be sized. Oh, this pump should be sized. So, I'm going to show in a video one of our booster pump stations that has five booster pumps on it. And one of them is running almost constantly. But once it shuts off, it'll cycle to the next pump and that pump will run. There are times, especially in periods of peak demand, where two or three of these booster pumps might be running. And that's because in periods of peak demand, a lot of water is being used by our customers. They're drawing a lot of water off. And we want to maintain system pressures. Our minimum pressure is 20 PSI. And the reason why, one of the reasons why is because it prevents water that's outside of our distribution system from leaking in. We call that infiltration or intrusion, I and I, infiltration and infusion, right? So um, if there's a crack or some type of defect in the pipe, in the distribution, we would rather the water escape than come in. When that happens, when water comes in, it contaminates the distribution system and the potable water supply. We no longer have potable water. Yeah. When we have water of an unknown quality, we have contamination. Oh, that's the photo I forgot to put in there. Mm -hmm. That stuff happens. <laughs> that's okay, it'll be on the video. Um, the first responsibility of the utility is to, there's three responsible responsibilities. Provide enough water to meet the total demand of the system. Provide water which is safe and palatable to the water users. Provide water when it is when it is needed. So these are the first responsibilities of the utility. Now, I want to say just as a note, and this is to everybody, not just my crew and my fellow operators that we work with in other departments. Our first job is to protect the health and safety of the customer. The customer is anybody who's using the water supply. That's our first job, our primary responsibility. However, this is the textbook version, right? And you see that we we have to provide enough water when they when it's um, to meet the total demand of the system. It's got to be safe. It's got to be palatable. It it's the aesthetics of the water when we talk about um, safe and palatable, it needs to taste good, look good, smell good. It's gotta meet those aesthetic demands from the water user. And we gotta provide that water when it's needed, even in periods of peak flow, and if there's an event going on like a fire, 
if there if, if you have multiple fire trucks out there fighting a fire even during peak demand we got to make sure that we're delivering enough water and that might be difficult to do because we we don't build because we're efficient we don't build extra ground storage tanks just for fun mm -hmm. one of the reasons why is because if we store water more than 24 hours it begins to go stale mm -hmm. yeah. and the customer can taste the difference besides that it's very expensive and who ends up paying for that it's our customers the ratepayers mm -hmm. we have to protect our ratepayers we have to be efficient so we're not asking or demanding that our ratepayers pay more yeah. for a water bill because we decided to build an extra ground storage tank that holds a million gallons of water. Distribution system pressures through the booster pump station. We manage our distribution pressures between 20 PSI and ideally we want to be maxed out around 70 PSI. Now in some of our system, and we have a rather large system out here, uh, multiple well sites, multiple ground storage tanks, multiple booster pump stations. And in some of those water systems or distribution systems, we have pressures that are above 70 PSI. And in some of them, we have pressures that are in lower in PSI. One of the reasons why is because we're built where we're at. We have to the west, a higher elevation that as it goes east, it drops down to a low elevation, and then further east, it goes back up again. It's almost it's like a valley. Kinda, yeah. Like a, it, one of our engineers calls it a taco. Ah, there you go. Which I kinda like that. At the uh, booster pump station, we have an EPDS. Entry point to the distribution system. What's significant about that is a few things. Number one, it's the beginning of the distribution system. You have the well site, ground storage tank, booster pump station. Once the booster pump station is putting water, discharging water, that's the entry point to the distribution system. And that's where our department takes over. That's why we control the valves right outside of a water plant. It's also a place where we can take samples. So we have an employee whose job it is 40 hours a week, five days a week, is to go around pull samples. And sometimes other people do it as well, depending on the circumstances and the type of sample it needs to be. But basically we have somebody going out nearly every day, pulling water samples, primarily to check for pop quiz. Pop quiz, uh, uh, chlorine. Chlorine? Chloramines. Chlor yeah, chloramines, I'm sorry. Oh, no, you were right. No. Was it you chlorine? were looking for a free chlorine residual. Yeah. We were uh, looking for a certain free chlorine residual in our water and our potable water supply. And that's gonna be much different at the EPDS than it's gonna be at the furthest point in our distribution system. Over time, chlorine is gonna degrade. Mm -hmm. It's gonna get used up. Our source water here in this private utility, or public, excuse me, private utility, is a, our source water is groundwater. Groundwater is full of dissolved minerals and dissolved gases. Chlorine reacts with all that. And because chlorine reacts with all that, it gets used. This, what, this uh, ground storage tank is a pretty good sized tank. Not very tall, but it's got a large diameter. And you see that it's being fed from multiple wells. So those, that piping that goes up the side and drops in at the top, those are fill lines, a well. Um, as the well is pumping, the water is being discharged up there into the top of the tank. And over on this side, you see that line that's coming out. Gravity allows the water to drain out of the ground storage tank. Out of that structure, it 90s down below ground and goes to the booster pump station. Let's take a look at the booster pump station. It's very loud here. We've got one of the booster pumps running right now. But you see the 90 that comes out of the ground. That pipe is full of water because of positive suction head with the ground storage tank. The level of the water in the ground storage te tank is well above the elevation of the booster pumps. It keeps that line full of water, which keeps the volutes primed. 
so of the five pumps, of the five booster pumps here, that line keeps all five of those volutes prime full of water. As long as we can maintain prime, we shouldn't be cavitating. Now, one of the other methods that we use to keep air out of the volute is you see where the water is discharged up at a 90 degree angle and turns on that 90. At the very top is an ARV, an air release valve. And because that's a high point, that's where air wants to gather and air is released through the ARV. So once the water hits that discharge manifold up there at the top end, that's the EPDS, the entry point to the distribution system. When you take a close look at that, you can see that we have pressure gauges. There's a mag meter or a magnetic flow meter on the discharge side. You also see sampling ports where we can sample the water. So if the chlorine residual is, and this is just an example, if it's two milligrams per liter at the EPDS, it might be 0.2 or 0 0.02 at the furthest point in the distribution system. And that's because it's still getting used as the water is moving through the distribution system. Number nine, when the water supply for the pump is located below the center line of the pump, that's gonna be C negative suction head, negative suction head or suction lift. Some of these questions, you're gonna see them in multiple study guides throughout the program. And why is that? The reason why is because you're probably gonna see it on an exam. And not just in distribution, you're gonna see it in other, um, other tests. In other exams, certification, yeah. In yeah. other certification exams, in other disciplines. That's the word I was looking for. Yeah. So it's gonna come up again and again and again. Number 10. When the water supply for the pump is located above the center line of the pump. Above is positive suction head. Positive Deep. suction head. That means gravity will take the water to the pump and maintain prime in the balloon. When it's negative suction head, the pump has to work to pull the water up to the pump. And, and then, then work just like, and then do the work of sending the water away. So it's much less efficient, more likely to fail. You know, that type of pump with negative suction head will have a foot valve on there or like a check valve. So once you, you close the check valve, you prime the volute, you prime the pump. So when you turn it on, it should be able to pull the water up, maintain prime, and maintain prime as it's pumping. It's still highly or much more likely to fail, much more likely to lose prime. Number 11, this houses the impeller. Uh, that would be the volute, the volute V. Number 12, never drain the volute even when the pump is removed from service. Is that true or false? That is false. When we take a pump out of service, if we just shut it down, if we just shut it down because it, it needs maintenance and maybe we have to order some parts and the parts aren't gonna come in for six weeks. Um, Pre-COVID pre is probably six weeks. Post-COVID is probably 52 weeks, mm. 26 weeks, something crazy like that. If we leave the water in the pollute, what happens to water? It's gonna get stale. It's gonna, it's go, gonna stale. go stale. Eventually all the dissolved oxygen is gonna come out of the water and it's gonna go septic. Once you have septic conditions, they're very acidic and corrosive and it attacks the metal. It'll destroy your impeller and the inside of your balloon. And any components that are getting wet. Mm -hmm. I had to learn that lesson the hard way. When I went to work at the water treatment plant, um, one of my operators and I, we took a booster pump out of service. We isolated it, but we never drained the balloon. And several weeks later, when the parts finally came in, we decided to go over there, pull that pump and rebuild it. As soon as we <laughs> unbolted the pump, the nastiest, most septic water came out of there. It was pretty disgusting. We had to power wash everything. And fortunately, it didn't do any permanent damage or damage to the impeller and pollute, but it was pretty bad. Number 13, what type of pump has rotating impellers within a pump case? Centrifugal. Centrifugal. 
Very good. Number 14, what is the most common type of pump you will find at a booster pump station? Centrifugal. Centrifugal. Centrifugal pumps are the most common types of pumps used in the water and wastewater industry. Number 15, in a centrifugal pump, which part physically separates the high pressure zone in the volute from the low pressure zone at the impeller eye? Or separate UV wear rings, A. Wear rings, A. Very good. Number 16, this occurs when the pump attempts to discharge water faster than it can be drawn into the pump. Cavitation, C. Cavitation, C. So basically, you're not getting enough water into the blue. The pump is wanting to pump it out faster than the water is coming in. And because so much is happening all at one time at a very high speed, the water tends to turn the vapor. Mm. We call that the NP, the net positive suction, NPSH. But we're going to get into that in another video. 17, this is considered the heart of a centrifugal pump. Well, the heart, that would be the impeller. The impeller. Hey. The impeller is the heart of a centrifugal pump. Thanks, fellas. I appreciate your time at the end of a very long day. Fortunately, we're not in 100 degree weather anymore, at least Thank for now. God. But, uh, yeah. Hey, I appreciate your time. Thanks, guys. Thanks, bud. I'm at a wastewater treatment plant to pump our final effluent a couple of miles down the road where we have a recharge facility. We use these vertical turbine centrifugal pumps. It's just like the well site where you see the motor at ground level. So imagine on this blue part right here, on top of that coupling is where you would mount the motor you see the shaft coming out of the pump side. The pump side extends all the way down to the screen that you see at the end of the black pipe, right? So that is the pump shaft. And the pump shaft, again, is attached to the motor shaft with a coupling. That is setting that apparatus right there, the wellhead, is setting on the 90, the discharge 90. So you can see that the water is pumped up from down here. This is the screen. Now this one's not designed to keep out sand. The final effluent pump station is water that looks just like a glass of water from your tap. It's nice and clear. It doesn't have sand and other particulates in it like a like a um, a well pump does. So this screen is much has much uh, larger openings. But what you see here is three bowls. One, two, three. Those are three volutes that house three different impellers. By themselves, they're each a pump. They're attached to a pump shaft that extends the entire distance up to the wellhead. So the water is pulled in through the screen. It hits that first pump, and let's just pretend it's a thousand gallons a minute at a hundred feet ahead. Well, the gallons per minute will not change, but the pressure will, or the head. So if that's 100 feet ahead, you have a second bowl there, another 100 feet ahead, because they're identical. So every pump has a suction side and a discharge side. You have the suction side where the screen is, and the discharge side is bolted directly to the suction side of the second bowl. The discharge side of the second bowl is bolted directly to the suction side of the third bowl. And then it goes to the discharge piping. So if these pumps are rated to flow 1,000 gallons per minute at 100 feet ahead, you have 100 feet ahead, 200 feet ahead, 300 feet ahead, but you can still only pump at 1,000 gallons a minute. That will not change. I'm 
I'm at a well site with some older vertical turbine centrifugal pumps. The um, and these are good examples of the submersibles, which you see right here. So that is the pump. You see, there's three bulls. You see the screen at the bottom. And at on this pump, it would be bolted where you see the screen to this cylinder to the right. That's the motor. So the bottom of the motor is at the bottom of this uh, support structure here. You see how tall that motor is? And at the top, they've got it uh, covered up to protect the electrical on the top side. So this pump here with three bulls, this multi-stage pump would be bolted to the top of that motor. And then above the pump, you would connect the discharge pipe. The discharge pipe is connected all the way to the surface. So as this motor and pump is being lowered down into the well, 20 foot sections of discharge pipe is being attached to it. You see another three stage pump. What we have over here on the end is the bottom end of a vertical turbine centrifugal pump. And that's the type that where you see the motor sitting on the ground, which these are the motors that you see at ground level. So out here in Arizona, especially in the area where I live and work, we see these farmers use these to pull water from channels, from canals. Um, and that is, this is the motor that's sitting on the ground or at ground level. And on the far right in the rack, you see the multi-stage pump that would be attached below this. There's a pretty good sized motor there. A spare, that's brand new. Here's another look at some booster pumps. And you see all three of these booster pumps have the motors attached to them. If you look through the impeller eye, you can see the impeller. And you see that snail-like design of the volute. It pulls the water in and then discharges it at a 90 degree angle. The pump itself is not very large. 